We are ready now for problem 44. This may or may not be the last video to complete all the review problems. We'll have to see. So this is a problem that goes back to something we learned about toward the start of class, where we have a circle, have an angle, the radius, and S is the arc length. But then also we look at this segment of the circle and we have an equation for the area in that segment. So there are two equations that we're going to use in this problem. Because here's the problem. Let me show you, it says, I want you to see the answers. Find the length S and the area A. So here it looks like it's a 70 degree angle. Radius is nine yards. So the two equations that we're going to use are the arc length equals the radius times the angle. Don't forget the angle once again has to be in radians to use this equation. And the area is one half r squared theta. So if I actually draw the exact problem we have, looks like we have a 70 degree angle and nine yards is the radius. First thing we have to realize is we have to convert the angle from degrees to radians. So we know how to do our unit conversion. Degrees is what we start with. So degrees go on the bottom, radians go on the top. And we know there are pi radians in 180 degrees. Now in this answer, when I look, both the answers are looking for, they say round to three decimal places. So when I do this calculation here, just to be safe, I'm gonna go up to like four or maybe even five decimal places. Once again, as you're doing these problems, where at some point you're gonna round off, you cannot round off too soon or it's gonna be a problem. So see if you can see that. So I'm gonna take 70 times pi. Now I have a pi key in my calculator. If some chance, for some reason you don't, you're gonna to have to enter pi out to at least four or five digits, 3.1415, whatever. You can't just enter 3.14 or you might end up with the wrong answer. So there's 70 times pi, then divided by 180. So I'm gonna write 1.22173, just to be extra safe, five digits. So now, if S is R times theta, R is, nine yards and here's theta 1.22173 so basically nine times 1.22173 so three digits the third digits this five you go to the next digit, which is a five and a seven. So this should get bumped up to 10.996 yards. And now the area, one half R squared theta, one half R squared is nine yards squared. 
Theta is once again one point two two one seven three. So let's go nine squared is eighty one. Eighty one divided by two times one point two two one seven three. 49.480, and I got a zero here, so it stays zero. And the units are yard squared. I don't know why I put this R here. All right, not too bad. 45, now we go back to the problems of inverse trig functions and sort of composite functions. So this, I'm gonna write down the problem that I'm given, but then I wanna take a few minutes and talk about these kinds of problems and even do some other examples to hopefully make this clear. So we have the inverse sine of the sine of seven pi over eight. First of all, this is not a special angle. So I can't, sometimes if this angle is a special angle, I can just sort of work out the trig function and the inverse trig function work inside out. I can't do that here because I don't know the sine of seven pi over eight. I don't need to know it. I'm just saying sometimes if it's a special angle, you can sort of do it in a different method. Now I wanna compare this problem and I'm gonna make up a second problem. Let's just compare it to say if I had the inverse sine, of the sine of pi over eight. The reason I do this is because you can't really treat these problems the same. So here's what I mean. With these kinds of problems, there is a potential, I'll call it a shortcut. A shortcut meaning an easy way to come up with the answer, and not have to, to do a lot of work or even necessarily figuring things out. Now the shortcut is because we're taking the inverse sine of the sine, you might think and you might hope that the inverse sine of the sine sort of cancel out. And therefore, when you have the inverse sine of the sine, since they cancel, you end up with seven pi over eight. And like I talked about before, it's almost like um, if you take the square root of five and you square it, it's like when you square a square root, it sort of cancel out and you just have left what's inside. So a lot of students will look at both these problems and they'll say inverse sine the sine sort of cancel out and they'll want to say this is seven pi over eight and this then would be pi over eight. Well, as it turns out, this one is correct. It is pi over eight, but this one is not correct. And I think the easiest way, so, so, so the idea is, you know, sometimes your shortcut works, sometimes it doesn't work. So as the first thing I want to show you is how do we know when we can and cannot use the shortcut? And it's actually pretty straightforward because you remember when we learned about inverse sine functions, Whenever you take an inverse sine function, we learned that the angle has to be the left-hand side of like the unit circle. I'm sorry, the right-hand side. And then these angles are a little bit different than the norm because if you go down here in what we call the fourth quadrant, we actually call these negative angles. So for an inverse sine 
function, we know the answer, the angle has to be over here someplace. So therefore, let me just put it this way, it's very straightforward. When we have this kind of problem, if the initial angle is over here, and what I call like the allowed zone sometimes with inverse trig functions, I'll call this side like the no zone, like we can't, we can't have angles over here, it's not allowed. But on the right hand side, angles over here are fine. So you can see pi over eight is like right in here somewhere. Seven pi over eight is probably over here somewhere. Since pi over eight is on the right half of my circle, the shortcut actually works. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail again about this. When I lectured over inverse trig functions, you can look at that. But the shortcut will work if this angle is on the right-hand side. If the angle is not on the right-hand side, then you cannot use a shortcut. In other words, this answer is not correct. So that's the first thing I want you to be aware of. So the first thing you can do is you should check to see if you can use a shortcut, because if you can, obviously, that's the quickest and easiest way to solve the problem. So what do you do if your angle, if you cannot use the shortcut? If you can't use the shortcut, you have to go back and look at the concept of the of reference angles. Remember reference angles are angles, two different angles that have the same trig functions except for the positive and minus. The numbers are the same. A quick, a quick review. So in other words, let's pick out some angles we know pretty well. How about um, pi over six? The reference angle for pi over six is just pi over six, right? The reference angle the shortest distance back to the x-axis. What if I go over here to five pi over six? So this should be review, the reference angle for five pi over six. This distance, you can think of pi here. I can change it to six pi over six. Therefore, from five pi over six, to six pi over six, how far do I have to go? Pi over six. So these two angles have the same reference angle. And because of that, if we look at the actual value, pi over six, this point here, the cosine and sine, square root of three over two, one half, and if I look at the trig functions of five pi over six, notice the numbers, when I say the numbers are the same, it's just in this case, five pi over six has a negative for the cosine, but the numbers are the same. The positive and minuses can change. All right, I say that to say all this. What I do when I have seven pi over eight, I need to go find the reference angle in on the right-hand side of this circle. So I'm gonna find the reference angle for seven pi over eight. Now I'm gonna go over here and find the reference angle that's the same. And in this case, I want it to also be the same sign. So let's do this again now. So here we go. Hopefully, 
once I finish this, it'll become clear what I'm saying. So once again, I'm gonna write down this problem again. When I see this problem, the first thing I say to myself is, can I use the shortcut? Well, since my initial angle is over here, I realize I cannot use the shortcut. So what I do is I go find the reference angle for seven pi over eight. And that means here's my seven pi over eight angle. This is the reference angle. So once again, if this angle here is pi and I convert it to a denominator of eight, I can think of this as eight pi over eight. So if this is eight pi over eight and this is seven pi over eight, it makes sense that this distance here must be pi over eight. Now what I wanna do is I wanna to go to my right-hand side of the circle and find the angles on the right-hand side that are reference angles with this, which means hopefully it's obvious that pi over eight is a reference angle. Although, and sometimes this is important, negative pi over eight, this also has the same reference angle. So there are actually two angles over here that have the same reference angle as seven pi over eight. Which one of these should I use? Well, I want to use the one that ends up having the same, the same positive or negative. Now, since I'm doing inverse sine here, I know the sine of seven pi over eight is a positive number. Here, I know the sine of pi over eight is positive, the sine of negative pi over eight is negative. Since I have to choose one of these reference angles, I'm going to choose the one where the plus and minus obviously stays the same. So really what I'm doing now is instead of looking at seven pi over eight, I'm not going to use pi over eight. So in other words, um, the reference angles for seven pi over eight and pi over eight are the same. So instead of use, I'm going to use pi over eight instead of seven pi over eight. So basically once you find the reference angle in your allowed area, then you in a sense have the answer. Let me do one more. How about I'll say the inverse sine of the sine of Actually, I'm going to choose one of the special angles, but I'm I'm going to use our little method we just did here. What if you're given the problem, the inverse sine of the sine of five pi over four? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to see if I can use the shortcut. Five pi over four is right here. So I cannot use a shortcut. It's in the left hand side of the circle and I'm looking for, I'm working with signs, so it's not okay. So let me go find the reference angle for this in the right-hand side. Since the sign here is negative, I know this is gonna be my reference angle. And for inverse signs, we call this angle here, negative pi over four. So in a sense, what I do is I go ahead and say the answer is negative pi over four. So if your initial angle is on the left-hand side, you go find the reference angle on the right-hand side and that reference angle will be the answer. One last one. 
Um, actually two, because this can be a little tricky. Let's do um, inverse sine of the sine of power over three. Let's see if I can use a shortcut. Power over three is up here. It's actually in the right half of the circle. The shortcut does apply and I can just put power over three. So here's one last one I thought of that can be sort of tricky. Um, how about the inverse sine of the sine of seven power over four? Seven power over four in our original unit circle is actually right here, right? So you say, well, it's on the right hand side. So can't you just, if you use a shortcut, can't you call it seven pi over four? Well, the problem is when you're taking inverse sine functions, we cannot use this notation. Remember for an inverse sine function, we would call this negative power over four. And we can sort of prove this, since this is a special angle, let's just work it the old fashioned way, the inside out. What is the sine of seven power over four? It's negative square root of two over two. Now what's the inverse sine function of negative two or square root of two? So I'm looking for the angle on the right hand side of the circle where the sine is negative square root of two, which is right here. But for inverse sine functions, we don't call it seven pi over four, we call it negative pi over four. So I hope that's clear. These problems um, can be a little tricky. And on top of that, just to be thorough, things change when you have inverse cosines. So let me just do a couple of these. How about I do inverse cosine the cosine of, um, just for fun, I'll say 11 pi over 10. And the inverse cosine of the cosine of 9 pi over 10. Now you approach these the same way as, as we did the inverse sine, except now you gotta remember for inverse cosines, we're looking for our angle to be in the top half of the circle. So to see if the shortcut rule applies, same idea, you go find your initial angle. And if it's in the top half, then you can use a shortcut. But if it's in the bottom half, then we have to go find the reference angle. Well, 11 pi over 10, this is pi and say I convert this to a fraction with a denominator of 10, it's 10 pi over 10. So 11 pi over 10 is like right here and turns out nine pi over 10 is right there. So nine pi over 10 is okay, I can use a shortcut. So the answer for this one would just be nine pi over 10. However, 11 pi over 10 is down here I cannot use a shortcut, that cannot be my answer. So I need to go find the reference angle in the top that has the same plus or minus. So I know the cosine here is a negative. So the same reference angles would be here and here, but over here, I know that the cosine is positive. I need the cosine to be negative. So actually the reference angle for 11 pi over 10 is nine pi over 10. So this answer is nine pi over 10. Let me do one more. Actually, I'll do two more. How about cosine, inverse cosine of the cosine of pi over four? Inverse cosine, the cosine of Pi over four is right here. 
It's in the top half of the circle. The shortcut works. It's just pi over four. Seven pi over four is down here. I can't use the shortcut. I need to go find the reference angle in the top half. Cosine down here is positive. Here's a reference angle at pi over four and it's positive. So therefore it's pi over four. All right, so initially this problem, maybe you thought was like a simple kind of problem, but there's actually a fair amount involved in understanding these in the math world. They're called composite functions. All right, hopefully that's clear. So now number 46, and this is something we've done before, but it's a different kind of problem in terms of the questions they're asking us. So that's when to do this, just so you understand the notation. So this is really something you've done before. So you're initially asked to solve this equation. So they say to solve, but they initially want the general form of the equation, right? The general form, once again, means all possible angles, not just between zero and two pi, not just one trip around the unit circle, but they want the answer if you go round and round the unit circle. So we've done this before. So we, the way we do this is we initially look at one trip around unit circle and we see what angles are a solution for this. So if you think about, you know, what are the angles where the cosine of that angle is negative one half, you think about two pi over three and you think about four pi over three. So there are really two solutions. You have this first angle, and then you have to add your, we'll call K our counter. And sometimes I'm not very careful because actually K can be zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, et cetera. But the second solution, and we have to write these separately, two pi times K, and the same as here. So you have two solutions. And actually, you'll see in the problem you were assigned, they initially ask for the smaller angle. So you write this answer for the smaller angle, and then they ask for the larger angle. So they're looking at the initial angle. And then the last part of the question is, they say list the first six solutions that are greater than or equal to zero. So they're looking for the first six angles that are solutions that are positive angles. And the way I always do it, easiest way is I make a little table here where K is like my counter and then I've got this angle here. So what I'm gonna do is, you start with K B equals zero. So when K is zero, then you write down both these solutions. When I plug in zero for K, you get two pi over three. You plug in zero for K, the second solution, the second equation gives you four pi over three. So two solutions, but they want us to get six solutions. So I have to go ahead and increase, or just for fun, just for fun, let's see what happens when you put in a minus one. So therefore with minus one, you would have two pi over three plus a negative two pi, or you can think of it as minus two pi. Now to combine these, you have to get a common denominator. Two pi is like six pi over three. 
So two pi over three minus six pi over three is negative four pi over three. There's a solution, but because it's a negative angle, they want the first six solutions that are a positive angle. So it looks like I don't need to really worry about checking out if k is a negative number. So therefore, let's do k equals one, and I put one for k, two pi over three plus two pi. Once again, you have to be able to sort of add fractions. Two pi over three plus two pi. If I get a common denominator, two pi is really six pi over three. So it looks like eight pi over three. If I do the same thing for the second equation, it's four pi over three plus two pi, which I can pretty much do that in my head, 10 pi over three. So I have four solutions. I need two more solutions. So I just keep increasing my counter K. K is called like a counter. So now I put in two for K and then my first equation, it's two pi over three plus four pi. Well, four pi is really 12 pi over three. So I get 14 pi over three. And the second equation is four pi over three plus four pi. So it's gonna be 16 pi over three. So now I have six solutions and this is what I would enter in for that last answer blank. So you've basically done this before, but in this problem, they ask for the general solution, and then they ask for the first six solutions. So I just wanna make sure that's clear when you have that kind of a problem. All right, 47. I'm actually gonna get a new piece of paper because 47, I might need some room to complete this. So 47 now, by the way, these last few problems of the review were sort of jumping around because these are some problems that, in case you don't know it, the addition of this book changed after the initial review problems were set up. So these are some of the problems from the newer edition of the book that wasn't initially included. So we're having to sort of tack them on at the end. So that's why we're sort of bouncing around a little bit. So here, problem 47, this is a problem with two angles. So initially they say tangent of alpha is negative 12 over five. And then they tell you alpha is between pi over two and pi. For me, when I think about this, Here's pi over two and here's pi. I just tell myself, you know what? This means this angle alpha is in the second quadrant. That's the key thing to, th to remember. But then there's a second angle beta and they tell me sine of beta equals one half. And then they say beta is between zero and pi over two, which is another way of saying beta is in quadrant one. So they're giving me two trig functions, well, two angles, two trig functions, and it told me what quadrant the angles are in. And then they asked to calculate four different problems. And these actual problems, sum and difference formulas. So they're saying, now what would be the sign of alpha plus beta? So now I have my sum and difference formulas here. I'm gonna write out what this would be. So when you add two angles together and take the sine, it ends up being the sine of alpha times the cosine of beta plus the cosine of alpha 
times the sine of beta. So in order to figure out the trig function of these angles, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the trig functions they've given me. And for alpha and for beta, what I like to do is I like to create sort of a right triangle that represents these trig functions. And once I've created the right triangles, I can easily figure out the sine and the cosine. So for alpha, negative 12 fifths. I'm really not worried about the negative sign because I know it's quadrant two. It's more like I'm worried about 12 fifths. I need to use that to create my right triangle. Tangent is toa, right? Opposite over adjacent. So the opposite must be 12, the adjacent's five. So the hypotenuse is 12 squared plus five squared. 144 plus 25 is 169. Square root of 169 is 13. Hypotenuse is 13. Now I'm gonna write here, to remind myself it's in quadrant two. So when I go get trig functions for alpha, this will help remind me whether it's a positive or negative number. Now I'm gonna do the same thing for beta, sine of beta is one half. So here's my beta triangle. Sine, so katoa, so opposite over hypotenuse, opposite hypotenuse. So this other leg down here is the hypotenuse squared minus the other leg squared. This is four minus one. So this leg is square root of three. And once again, I'm gonna mark a note here. This angle is in quadrant one. So now I can go up here and fill in numbers for my little formula here. Sine of alpha, I go to my alpha triangle and I say, what's the sine? The sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So it's 12 over 13. I'm in quadrant two, the sine of quadrant two is positive. So sine of alpha is just 12 over 13. Cosine of beta, so I go to my beta triangle, cosine, so ka is adjacent over hypotenuse. So square root of three over two. Now in quadrant one, cosine's positive. So it's a positive square root of three over two. Plus cosine of alpha. So I go back to my alpha triangle. Cosine, so ka adjacent over hypotenuse. Five over 13. Now in quadrant two, the cosine's actually a negative number. So I have to make this negative five over 13. And then finally, the sine of beta, I go back to my beta triangle, the sine is so katoa, opposite over hypotenuse. And in quadrant one, the sine is positive, so it's like that. So now I've plugged in my numbers. Now I have to do a little bit of math, multiply these two fractions. Or I can think of the 12 and the two, reduce this down to six and one. Hopefully you can see how I would get six square root of three over 13. Although you know what, because I'm gonna combine these, let me not cancel. Let me just leave it as 26 in the denominator. 12 square root of three over 26. I'm multiplying a negative times a positive, so it ends up being minus five over 26. And now, since these have the same denominator, 
I can combine them into one fraction, 12 square root of three minus five. So that's the sign of alpha plus beta. Now there's three more parts and for all the parts, I'm going to use these two triangles here. It's just the formulas change. So let's see if we can do them fairly quickly. So part B, they want to know the cosine of alpha plus beta. So I go back and look at the formula for the cosine of the sum of two angles and you get cosine alpha times cosine beta minus sine alpha times sine beta. So now I just go to my alpha and beta triangles, same triangles and plug in these numbers. Cosine alpha, so ka five over 13, but I'm in quadrant two, so it's negative five over 13. Cosine of beta, square root of three over two, minus sine of alpha, five over 13, opposite over hypotenuse. Quadrant two, the sine is positive, so it's just five over 13. Sine of beta, one over two, So if I multiply out these two fractions, it's gonna be negative five square root of three over 26 minus five over 26. So now we have the same denominator. Although the good thing is I have the answers here. And it looks like my answer is not correct. So let me go see where I made a mistake. And that's why I have the answers here. Let me make sure my formula is correct. So this is, so if you did a problem like this and you answered it, it was incorrect. Then you would go back and you would try and figure out what you could have done wrong. So cosine of alpha, so ka, five over 13 negative, Cosine of beta square root of two, that looks correct. Sine of alpha, see here's my mistake. Sine is 12 over 13. Maybe some of you, when I initially did this, were sort of yelling at your screen, that's not correct. So it's 12 over 13. So when you multiply this, this ends up being 12. So now when I combine these two fractions, it's gonna be what I expect. So this is why I actually have the answers handy. So I don't, well, I misled you for a few minutes, but I don't end up actually giving you the wrong answer because this is the correct answer. So C, two more parts. Now they take the sine of the difference of the two angles. So once again, it's just a matter of writing down the formula. Sine alpha times cosine beta minus cosine alpha times sine beta. Now plug in the numbers. Actually, instead of going to the triangles, let me go up to here, just so I don't confuse myself again. Sine of alpha, looks like it's 12 over 13. Cosine of beta is square root of three over two. Cosine of alpha is negative five over 13. Sine of beta is one half. Oh, sorry if you can see that. So let's multiply these out. 12 square root of three over 26. I'm subtracting. This is gonna be a negative number, so it's right plus 
0.5 over 26. If you put this common denominator, 12 square root of three plus five over 26. And then the last part, I think I can squeeze it in here, although it, this one is going to be a little messier. Tangent alpha minus beta. It's messier because this ends up being a fraction of formula. So it's tangent alpha minus tangent beta over one plus tangent alpha times tangent beta. So now we haven't done tangent yet. So tangent of alpha, tangents opposite over adjacent, TOA, right? So for alpha, opposite over adjacent is 12 fifths. In quadrant two, tangent's negative. So negative 12 fifths minus tangent of beta, one over square root of three. And tangent in the first quadrant is just a positive, so it's one over square root of three. All of that over one plus tangent of alpha, which is negative 12 over five times tan beta, which is one over square root of three. So actually, this is messy enough that I cannot finish it on this page. So let me copy it down and we're gonna have to simplify this. So this is some messy sort of calculations so of negative 12 over five minus one over square root of three all over one plus negative 12 over five times one over square root of three. Need to combine these fractions on the top, I need to get a common denominator, which is gonna be five square root of three. So I need to convert both of these fractions to a common denominator. So hopefully you remember how to do this. So this first fraction would end up being negative 12 square root of three over five square root of three. Second fraction would end up being five over five square root of three. For this one, I'm gonna go and multiply out these two fractions. So a negative times a positive means it's gonna be negative. 12 times one is 12 over five times the square root of three. If I go to the top, let's go and now combine these into one fraction. So it's negative 12 square root of three minus five over five square root of three. Now I need to combine these. One, I need to convert to sort of my common denominator, which is five square root of three. So this is gonna be five square root of three minus 12 over five square root of three. Wow. So now I have a complex fraction, one fraction over another fraction. Now, if you don't quite see what this is gonna be, you can do it the long way. You can write the top fraction times the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. But what actually happens is, is these two cancel out. So you're eventually left with negative 12 square root of three minus five over five square root of three minus 12. Now the problem is they might, if you answered this in the homework, I don't know, they might accept it. I mean, cause it's, it is, I think it's a correct number. I hope I didn't make any mistakes, but normally they don't sometimes still like leaving square roots in the bottom of a fraction. So if you recall the way to get rid of this, if you need to rationalize this, this is a binomial, you have to multiply by the conjugate. 
which means the same two terms, but you change the sign inside. So this problem is just continues to be sort of ugly. Now when you multiply by the conjugate, the two conjugates, the shortcut is you take the first term and you square it. So hopefully when you square this, that means you square the five, which is 25 and you square square the three, which is three. So this is actually 75 Then it's always minus and then you square the second term. So you have that. And now, unfortunately, you got to just multiply out. You got to FOIL these, which is crazy. So minus 12 square root of 3 times 5 square root of 3 is minus 60 square root of 3. Minus 12 square root of 3 times 12 is minus 144. I don't think I'm going to have enough room. I should have started it down here. So let's do minus 60 square root of 3 minus, oh, and this is not even correct. Good thing I did it. Because you have minus 60, then square root of three times square root of three is actually three. So it's actually negative 180, because you've got negative 12 times five, negative 60, square root of three times square root of three is three. So it's really negative 180. And then minus 144 square root of three. And then negative five times this is negative 25 square root of three. And then negative five times 12 is negative 60. Now the bottom I believe is correct. So this is gonna be I think negative 69. Now combine like terms, negative 180 minus 60 is negative 240. These are like terms, negative 169 square root of three over negative 69. And one thing more thing, since it's three, three terms are all negative, those can cancel out. And then you get finally the correct answer. So that was very messy to get the answer that they have. All right, that was a lot of work. So actually there are three more problems left. Let me go ahead and stop now and maybe we'll do these last three problems on the last video.